first drum we're all born with is, of course, our heart. It's the heartbeat that starts life. And when that rhythm stops, our life stops. The fear of the drum that I found is because it creates unpredictable responses in people. Um, the same rhythms that can get you moving and dancing can also get you in a complete meditative trance state. It's all relative to your own experience and your own heartbeat. So I've wondered like, how you would describe music to somebody who couldn't hear, or some alien that came down who never heard music. How would you describe music? Rock and roll, jazz, classical, Indian, American, Middle Eastern, African. The melody is what you would think of. How would you describe a melody? It's very difficult if you think about it. The same way you describe color to someone who hasn't seen. But for someone who hasn't heard, to describe music is very hard. But now you think about describing rhythm. All you do is tell them to put their hand on your heart. And there's rhythm. You can pulse their body, too, and there's rhythm. Rhythm is basic. And we hear, all hear that music is a universal language, but it's truly rhythm is a universal language. It starts with rhythm. Melody came much later. Language came much later. Our first language was indeed the way we would communicate as animals and birds in nature communicate and other species. They would communicate to commune, to hunt together, to organize, to warn. And this is where language actually began, where our early ancestors trying to communicate like nature communicated. And to this day, there are still tribes in Africa that will communicate through long distances of whistles and sounds to communicate, to actually coordinate a hunt and to surround an animal that they're trying to get. It all started with rhythm. My concern of where we're at now is that I feel we're denying that rhythm, that individual sense of rhythm. Technology has really taken over now in a way that becomes very predictable. All our feeds on social media are very predictable. We're so amazed when there's an ad that comes up of something we just talked about or searched on. That's less about being heard by you know, the idea of Siri or the phones or actually picking us up. It's more in our predictable nature of how we search on things, how we look for things. AI and robotics now knows what we get, um, where that dopamine gets released from. It knows the things that makes us feel good. And that's pretty much what we try and surround ourselves with. So in the way that technology has taken over music, what it's really done is not so much taken over music, it's denied us the practice of music. So all anybody has to do is get a loop station, get a drum machine, get a keyboard, hold the key down, and there's your beat. You don't have to spend 10 years to get a drum set to get a teacher to practice 10,000 hours and sit down and go, right? It takes the hard part of being a musician away, which means the music doesn't have that same sense of achievement. It has much more of a sense of gratification. Gratification is something that satisfies our immediate need for something. Achievement is something you work towards, something you strive to be. And in that process, it'll get rid of those who really aren't committed. How I connect that to our social network. As I said, once our drums became digitized, that's when our social network became digitized. We would follow our drums anywhere. Our drums would play in the field. We go to the field. Our drums would go to the cave. To meditate, we go to the cave. Our drums would go around the fire to tell stories. We'd go around the fire. Once our drums went into the computer, where did we go? We all followed them right into the computer. Our social network now communes around our digital drumming. So if you remove the idea of a good or bad, of a right or wrong, of screen time being bad for us, of all these ideas now that academic studies have said, this is why technology is bad. I don't like the word bad, because this is how we've naturally evolved. It started with the clock. About 1100 AD, the first clock towers came in. Before that, it was a sundial. Before that, it was a stick in the ground with the shadows. It was still a much larger increment of time we were dealing with. So we weren't responsible for these tiny bits of time. It was morning, midday, evening. 
It was seasonal. It was gestational. So around 1100 AD, the clock towers came in with only hour hands. About 100 years later, a minute hand comes in. Another 100 years, a second hand comes in. Right after that, now it's not clock towers, it's clocks in our homes. We go from clocks in our homes to now our wristwatch. You see where I'm going with this. Time is responsible for modern civilization. There's a theory called time discipline. This says modern civilization could not have even begun if we didn't have some synchronic form of mechanical time to all commune around. And right now, every single one of you has the exact same time as everybody else. This is unprecedented. The theory of relativity of time that Einstein so brilliantly came up with is no longer relative. You're three minutes late, everybody knows you're three minutes late. You can't say my watch is running slow. You can't say no more excuses like this. So I say, if I'm three minutes late to a meeting and someone's looking at that saying 180 seconds and this is wrong, I say after 13.2 billion years, I'm sorry, I think that's pretty, that's pretty good <laughs> to be 180 seconds off this. We're now down to atomic clocks measuring time to a trillionth of a second. That's off every billion years, but it's still off. What do we have tomorrow? No, not tomorrow. Today is leap year, right? So every four years we have to add a day. This is imperfection. Our orbit is not round, it's elliptical. Our clock is perfectly round. So break down that one day every four years. That's a minute a day, almost, that we're off. Yet we still give such dependence to this sense of time, the sense of mechanical time. Instead of pointing a finger at comparing the music, instead of pointing a finger at technology being good or bad, I really want to get to the point of what it's taken away is our sense of what you just experienced up here with Nitin and myself, of this real language of drumming. I can go anywhere in the world without even a drum, a table, a floor, my body. And any drummer knows exactly what I'm saying. I've spent hours and hours on stage performing with musicians I've never able to been, to, been able to sp speak a word with. Yet we completely understand each other, as does the audience. I start a beat immediately. Everybody starts dancing. This is inherent in our response system of trusting each other. Back in the days of, a, the, of, of exploration across the European continent, Marco Polo would travel with a drummer. Forts, old forts in China have drums outside the gates, as I'm sure they do here as well. His drummer would play as he would approach a city. He'd play a rhythm and play in a style to let the city know, or the fort, or wherever he was approaching, that we're coming. But the rhythm was saying, we're coming in peace, or we're coming to take you over. So, prepare. The drummers would respond in light. This idea of communication has been around for hundreds of thousands of years, if not millions of years. Studies have shown that our, our evolution of being able to walk upright coincided with our ability to also have the motion in our hands to be able to drum. When primates drum on their chest, we think that's some primal thing. That's communication with a fist, open hand, down here. All these different sounds, Nitin playing his face, right? This is not primal. This is a source of our communications, a source of our trust. So as our music has evolved to a point that we don't have the same trust in that what we're hearing is being real, is it a programmed rhythm? Is it auto-tuned vocals? What followed after that is also misinformation in our news feeds. What do we trust anymore? I still say we trust each other. I'm trusting everybody in this room right now is hearing what I'm saying. You know it's real. For the most part, I'm kind of improvising here, like what I do up there. But you still trust that I know what I'm talking about. Is that in the tone of my voice? Is that in my body language? Is that in what I just did, in what you just saw? 
Yes, with everything. So rhythm manifests in our lives daily in many, many ways where it's not just our own communication. I'm looking at this beautiful baby right here who's not hearing a word I'm saying, but look at how he's interacting now. Knowing exactly who to trust. <laughs> so I've titled this talk Drum Language and the Rhythm of Indian Traffic. And you're probably wondering what that means. Uh, I've been coming to India for over 20 years. It's had an enormous influence on me. I've, uh, my wife, Aparna, is from Mumbai originally, so I have my daughter, Uma, and Anishka are both half Indian now. This country has been uh, a gateway to me understanding levels of rhythm I never was exposed to in the West, certainly not the rock and roll drumming, although there's a whole power in that that maybe doesn't exist here. But the intricacy of rhythm in Indian music is like nowhere else in the world. I call it the physics of rhythm. And when I first came here and heard tabla and I heard Merdangam and Pakwaj and Gatam, I was about 28 years old, already well into a career playing my drum set. And my mind was blown. I couldn't believe it. I went home and I thought, I'm going to start learning tabla. I'm going to start learning these instruments and these rhythms. And I realized it was, it's another lifetime. So what I did instead is learn the essence of how this rhythm evolved here. What I've done here is create my own setup and my own language. That's so you don't hear my accent. So when I speak, I speak fluently. And I'm not a good American tabla player. I'm not a novelty in that way. This allows me to play with the best musicians here in India because I'm not trying to do what they do. So when I arrived this trip, I've been here for two months and I came to the beginning of January and I was, I've been in Mumbai a lot. And traffic in Mumbai is, uh, you know, it's, from a Western view, we see this and it just is absolute chaos. We think, how? How is this every car not hitting each other? How is every person crossing the street not getting run over? What, how do you still have side mirrors on your car? I mean, everything about traffic here, it, it fascinated me. And I just said the very beginning of my trip, I said, I'm going to figure out the equation of Indian traffic because it's not chaotic. You're not having accidents. You're not hitting people all the time. And the whole time I've been here, I've not seen one traffic accident in the city, only on the highways. You see the cars off on the side. But in the city, where every intersection should be <laughs> complete chaos. And so for weeks, I was telling friends, too, I was like, I've, I've got to figure this out. Because I know it's an abstract rhythm. But if there's a, a rhythm, that means there's a system. If there's a system, that means there's a pattern. And if there's a rhythm, that means there's a tempo. So it can be abstract. It can be an odd meter. It can be something that doesn't always lock to the one. But every other bar comes back to the one. That's for the musicians in the audience who understand what I'm talking about. So about two weeks into my trip, I was crossing the street with my friend. And in America, we cross a street and, you know, we'll run across the street. The car is 20 feet, 30 feet, 50 feet away, and we'll still run across the street. And if somebody walks across the street, it means they kind of have an attitude, you know, that's like, oh, they'll stop, you know. So I wouldn't naturally run across the street. The rickshaws, the motorbikes, the cars, everything stormy towards me, so of course I'm gonna run. My friend would always walk. So I'd get to the other side of the street and he would just be walking like this. <laughs> it was an epiphany. This is absolutely my point of singularity. I started looking up the street, down the street, everywhere. Nobody runs across the street. And you're gonna see this from here on out, when you leave this place, you're gonna look out at the streets of Pude, the streets of everywhere, everybody walks across the street. Mothers with five children, just, nope. <laughs> the cars are gonna stop. I realized this was the tempo, right? The people walking are the tempo. If they ran, then that rickshaw coming in this lane the car behind it in the next lane wouldn't see that, so you'd probably get hit by that car. And then if that car missed you, then the motorbikes in the next lane <laughs> wouldn't see you. So running across the street throws the whole system off. So the same way I'm up here, and I'm playing like this. Right? The tempo is still... There's the traffic.
There's the traffic. Here are the people walking across the street. <laughs> and I cannot cross the street now without. <laughs> I just walk in. It's like a superpower. It's like, no, oh, that it's blazing right down here. It is not going to hit me. And it doesn't. Hence the title of the rhythm of Indian traffic. If you now go to that point of the tempo being our heartbeat in a meditation, what's the hardest thing to do? It's to get rid of the traffic of our thoughts, right? Our head. Thoughts, 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 thoughts. thoughts. I got to breathe. I got to breathe. If your heart's like this, you're never going to get there. You've got to get your heart rate down. Your heartbeat's got to start walking across the street. So the traffic makes sense. You see? These are things technology will never figure out. No matter how much information you plug in to any AI program, to any algorithm, to anything to do with telling us how to cross a street, any pattern, it would never figure this out. This is observational. And this is the thing I miss most about technology taking away from us. Observation in music of having a relative experience with our music. A relative experience of communication. Something more than a thumbs up to communicate any number of things. Is that a sarcastic thumbs up? Is it really another thumb or another finger that's meant to be going up? <laughs> I don't know. I have to clarify that. If I'm with that person, I know immediately, right? I see your faces and I see the way you're responding to these stories. I know immediately, okay, that's being understood. Imagine me trying to text this talk to you and telling this story. Is he serious? Is he funny? I don't know what's going on, right? These are the things. It's the subtle nuances in our lives. It's not a good or bad. Unfortunately, I don't think it's going to go back. I don't think it's going to reach a point that, um, that we've ever had before. So in closing, it's really more about how do we remedy this? How do we reach a point where we continue our evolution of communication, our evolution of the arts? Music. It doesn't mean only by organic music. But think of it as an environmental issue. That if indeed we stop communicating with each other altogether, and we isolate ourselves so much that we don't know even what a facial expression means anymore, then this little one right here, how will it communicate? This is where it all comes from. It's the heartbeat that starts our life, the trust of that womb, of all the sounds in there, of our mother's heartbeat that we start from, and indeed sharing that heartbeat with somebody else in our lives and realizing that we're all in this together and we just cannot lose ourselves in the whole process. Thank you very much.